So we're going to share the screen. Great. Okay. So fantastic to have everyone with us. We're going to be kicking off. And uh, this is our very first cyber webinar. We're really, really excited to be coming to you and to be talking about this kind of topic. It is hopefully going to be the first of many webinar virtual events that we're Absolutely. going to be running uh, on a whole wide range of topics. Um, so you have the opportunity to also tell us either now in the chat or afterwards uh, via email, you can let us know the topics you're interested in hearing about, um, because within this area, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, there are so many different topics and discussions that we have internally. Uh, and so we wanted to introduce you to some of those ideas and conversations today, but also um, some of the organizations, some of the people, uh, some of the case studies, uh, and that's what we're gonna be bringing to you over the course of the coming weeks and months uh, via the virtual event. So look out for more uh, and we're going to be getting in touch with you uh, and uh, after in the coming days. So uh, look out for that. When we were thinking about having our first ever virtual event, there are so many different topics that we can cover. And if we're looking back at the last year, there are so many different things that happened over the course of the year. So we wanted to keep it a little bit more casual, a little bit more relaxed, but talking generically and generally about what happened in 2022. And so that's really what we're going to be talking about now. We're going to be explaining a little bit about the problem. Uh, we're going to be talking through uh, some of the case studies or lowlights that we've seen over the course of the year. But we're going to end on a positive of some of the specific, actionable, practical things that people in the room could be looking at or be thinking about uh, going into 2023. So maybe I'll uh, hand over Dan and we can yeah. uh, kick off. Absolutely. We actually, you know, we thought of starting that whole kind of live conversation around the topic of what is it that we are trying to look at, right? What is it that we're trying to solve from a disinformation standpoint, fake news, propaganda? And so we thought of maybe just explaining what we're trying to tackle here and why is it you know, kind of so important for the people watching and listening. Um, and there's no way to go around it. At the end of the day, what we're seeing is that almost every kind of topic, almost every kind of decision making that we see today revolves around social media conversations. And funnily enough, and we're going to talk about those kind of case studies throughout the next few minutes, um, whether it's related to buying a car, getting divorced, being a celebrity, being an NBA player, or even getting in terms of going through elections worldwide, um, we see that bad and fake actors are part of every day's conversations. And so I don't think this is a misconception anymore to think that this is not a big problem for anyone. I think this, this has become sort of a, of a mainstream problem. And, and of course, you know, and emphasize the fact that this is part of who we are. This is part of our DNA. You know, 10, 15 years ago, um, 10, 15 years ago, I think we were in a very different place. And from our perspective, um, we just believe that uh, we, are, we are at a place where we have to find a way to filter those conversations perfectly. And while technology is only going so far, we just want to bring something new uh, to this whole place. So yeah, that, that's why we wanted to have this. That's why we wanted to talk about the problem and maybe just get everyone on the ground base, which is why are we here? I guess that's, that's really what we wanted to do. So let's go, let's go deeper. Um, here's an interesting idea. Do you, do you know why this hasn't been solved? I'm asking Rafi, but I mean, it's kind of, kind of a, everyone sort of question. Why do we see that problem not being solved internally from social media platforms? I see that people suggest sometimes that it's just too difficult to solve. It is. Well, I mean, so it is difficult because of the subjectivity sometimes of disinformation, fake news and propaganda for sure. So technologically speaking, there's, there's a massive challenge, absolutely. Um, but the, I think the other side of the coin, which makes perfect sense when you think about it, it's the fact that social media platforms um, 
have been built for one purpose, you know, 15, 17 years ago, but eventually it, 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 it sort of evolved into a, a much larger scale problem where today they have a counterintuitive financial incentive of solving it, right? Because eventually social media platforms have built something incredible to be able to connect between me and Rafi and whomever around the world. But that also means that they are, they have a business model that revolves around gaining traction, gaining eyeballs, right? And that's the advertising business model. And so that is why we haven't seen any genuine measures being taken by these social platforms internally. When we talk about the chief information security people, the CFOs, the CMOs of these companies, because there is a, a monetary incentive that makes almost no sense to actually go and solve that thoroughly, right? And so the goal for this conversation is to say, if they are not going through and making those genuine, legit efforts around that, there ought to be external players, whether it's technological players, it's think tanks, universities, and even public sector agencies that have to be involved around trying to make a dent and sort of make a change throughout that. So that is sort of the, the, this entire reasoning of, of why it hasn't been solved up until today and who's influenced by it, which is us, the simple people that are being exposed to the wrong narratives by the wrong people. That's kind of why we're looking at this. Um, this, well, you know, yes. <laughs> All right, let's just take off the gloves for a second and just say what <laughs> needs to be said. Um, we just talked about this. Like we just, we've just spoken about, you know, talking to the social platforms. And interestingly enough, when we, you know, late April, when we saw the acquisition of Elon Musk acquiring Twitter, which is now is going through, we realized that um, we had to go and talk to the Twitter folks. And, and when we received the answer of yes, but no, thank you, as in we came to them and said, we would like to help. Eventually, Twitter told us that this is not the right timing. They are heavily involved and you know, extremely busy around making sure that this acquisition goes through and that they can have the best, smoothest transition. So eventually, instead of working again, like we said earlier, instead of working internally, and, and you know that from the inside, um, we went on and started working and eventually being commissioned by Elon Musk and his entire team um, to understand the true nature and, and, and the depth and the breadth of that problem, mm -hmm. right? And they, they were, you know, the media and everyone else around the world, they were labeling it as a spam and bot accounts issue and the authenticity of the platform. Um, but if you're asking us, the people that are on the technological solution side or anyone else, it goes deeper than the simple ratio. It's not a single digit problem ratio. It's not a, oh my God, are we looking at a, at a 3% spam and bot accounts or 11 or 13.7? It goes way beyond. Because what we realized, and that, that's kind of what we said throughout the last, the last few years of existence. This is not just about being able to serve Elon Musk and explaining um, the percentages of spam and bot accounts or inversely the percentages of genuine people. It's actually around understanding the snowball effect, the ripples effect of how one bad or fake actor can go really, really beyond anything that we would have imagined. And sometimes this can really can affect the vast majority of a narrative when you think about the most interesting kind of spiciest topics around the world. So it is never around the single digit, what is the ratio of inauthenticity or not. It's around understanding this whole equation of real bad fake, but also understanding around the impact that it has on all the other people that are getting exposed to that type of content. And that, that's what we were doing with Elon Musk and his team. And that's what we've been doing with everyone else in the industry, really. And I think as a company, uh, yeah, feel free to pitch in, but I think as a company, that's one of the things that we were stressing 
uh, and emphasizing during the debate conversation news over the last few months is that there was a big conversation about the raw number what is the number of uh, bots fake account in authentic activity but it's more than that it's actually not just the number but it's also the the, the propagation what's the impact that we feel as everyday users on social media. And I think if there's one thing that we take away from this conversation, one thing that we want to emphasize, it's it's that. It's don't look at just the numbers, the conversations are just, is it 11, is it five, is it 13.7? It's not, that's not enough just to answer that one question. It's important to answer, but it's, uh, it's more than just that. It is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So we're gonna uh, move on to uh, talk about a few case studies. There was so much that our team and that our platform uncovered during the course of the year. Tons of interesting stuff. Of course, uh, if you want to read more about the interesting things that we uncovered, you can, of course, go to sarabra.com uh, and check out the blog posts uh, and the articles that we've had. Uh, and so that's really relevant for other topics. But we're also going to talk about three different case studies, all completely different uh, of studies that we uncovered. Um, and I think in years gone by, when you spoke about this information, particularly in election years, you would think, okay, elections, protests, maybe the last few years over the COVID period, you could hear about vaccine disinformation. But I think 2022 was really the year that disinformation, misinformation, fake accounts, fake news became uh, a part of everyday life that pervaded every single aspect or conversation uh, as Dan, as you mentioned earlier, um, every single aspect, it didn't just have to be politics, it could be the products that we're buying, it could be the celebrities that we're following. And so some of the case studies that we're going to be looking at uh, is going to be looking at that. So Ukraine, a huge event over the course of this year that unfortunately it continues to, uh, uh, to happen and take place, uh, and we hope that it ends soon. Um, another one is, on a slightly different note, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. You know, who didn't uh, follow that story or, uh, you know, who wasn't you know, exposed to that kind of crazy story that happened over the course of the year? I definitely did. Uh, and we followed it. Yeah. We followed it. Very that, closely. Yeah. Very closely. Um, and the last one is the US midterm election, the very recently, just last month, midterm elections. And so we're going to start with Ukraine. When the conflict began, even before it began, we could feel that a conflict normally is a very fertile ground for disinformations, disinformation campaigns being waged one uh, or the other. And so our analysts got to work and we started to look at the kind of conversations that are taking place. And one of the things that we were struck even before the beginning of the conflict, even when there was talk that the conflict was going to happen, is the sudden spike of conversations. Now, any global event that is being covered by the world media, and people are discussing at length, you would expect a natural increase in conversation. But what our analysts, what our cyber platform uncovered was actually in one day, there was an 11,000% increase in the conversation about Ukraine. That, that kind of set off some alarm bells of suspicion uh, that, that prompted us to look even further into exactly what was happening. And what we uncovered was, was even more fascinating, scary, uh, impactful and important. Um, we uncovered that actually a big chunk of that increase was driven by fake accounts. And a, the majority of those fake accounts had actually been created in the four to five days before the conflict began. So this was very much a coordinated en masse, fast, at speed uh, disinformation campaign uh, right. that we were witnessing in real time. As the conflict was taking place on the ground, we also see uh, a war that's being conflicted on social media. Uh, and so we uncovered quite a few different things, all incredibly interesting, um, fascinating for all of us as a society uh, and world leaders to study in the months uh, to come. But also what was interesting, something in particular to draw our attention to was that we uncovered a few dozen, around about 30 different profiles, all inauthentic, acting as a community, acting as a cluster that our platform was able to uncover. And they were all inauthentic profiles that were posing themselves as Polish, directing content in Polish at the Polish population. And it was all very much pro-Russia and anti-Ukraine with the aim, you know, we can deduce from that, of trying to turn the tide of public opinion amongst the Polish population against the Ukrainians. Now, if you think, why is that happening? And then, you, but if you look at the news and you see actually the Polish population as a country, they're very welcoming to the Ukrainian population. They really open their arms 
uh, and, and accepted the, the Ukrainians into their home. So it kind of makes sense, but it's also uh, pretty worrying that actually a very small but effective, it doesn't take many fake accounts to be able to direct their disinformation at the Polish population. So I think that the, the takeaway that, that we get from this is that the scale and the speed at which we saw the uh, disinformation campaign and misinformation campaigns pop up um, makes it, you know, at any world event that if there are people with uh, certain intentions, um, they can come up and start to have an impact in a very short space of time and, and en masse. So that was something that we studied very closely and we will continue to, to look at. On a completely different topic is the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial story, uh, you know, debate uh, that was covered by pretty much media, out every media outlet. Everyone. Now, I'm going to give a little secret away that our lead analyst, Ronnie, she's a huge fan of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And so when the this started to appear in the news, it was actually her that was just curious, just because it's someone that she follows or two celebrities that she follows. We weren't really expecting much, nor would we in the past have expected much. You know, it's elections that we're looking at, it's protests, it's you know, disinformation on that kind of level. But I mean, we do have kind of sort of a skepticism within that, within that team and within the company because this is who we are, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to be the vigilante of online conversations. And therefore, when we see things happening online, we always say, is it? Or isn't it right? So, so, so that level of skepticism led us to working on the behind the scenes and saying, should we go deeper into the biggest, most discussed kind of divorce worldwide? Sorry for uh, cutting you no, off. No, absolutely. So there was the suspicion and the curiosity yeah. that drove yeah, yeah. it, but actually, what we uncovered was mind blowing <laughs> and led us down a period of weeks and months where the more we looked, the more we uncovered, the more we were amazed at the dis and misinformation campaigns that were taking place, the way that the social media world was captivated by this conversation, driven by the pro Johnny Depp or pro Amber Heard camp, and there was actually very little in the middle. Uh, and so uh, what we uncovered, and even in the first few days of the topic, was that nearly 11% of the conversation was driven by inauthentic profiles. Now that number really stood out at us because if you think of you know, more than 10%, that's kind of approaching the election and the protest and the kind of yeah. spicier topics. Um, and, and it's definitely something that we you know, amazed us and something we wanted to explore even further. And so that's you know, really something that we took us by surprise and we continued to look into that. And actually, I think we were speaking just before that it was inauthentic profiles that were driving a lot of the conversation. And that, but there was a lot of conversation tapping into all of these hashtags, whether you're one camp or the other. There was very little in the middle. Uh, but it was also authentic pages or fan pages as well that was driving a lot of the conversation. And we saw in the who was winning the social media war between the two camps actually very much the Johnny Depp camp, the fan pages and the groups were having a greater reach. So we didn't just look at the content units, we looked at the reach and the engagement and the exposure of those different hashtags and it was fascinating. Um, something else um, that we, we looked at was not just the two celebrities, not just the two individuals, but how that the fallout affected everyone else who was involved, if there was an individual in the trial, if there were companies being involved, if there were brands that were sponsoring one or the other, they were kind of sucked into this story in a way that they could probably never have predicted earlier. One of the brands that we saw impacted negatively was Aquaman, where we actually saw the conversations around Aquaman rise during the course of the trial. And the negative sentiment about Aquaman increased by 17%. So it wasn't just a case of two celebrities. It was, you know, that everything associated with them as well was affected one way or the other by the very strong conversations. So our takeaway from looking at this and from the many weeks and months that we spent analyzing this particular uh, uh, case that took place in 2022 is that uh, if you think that disinformation, misinformation, social media chaos uh, is restricted, just to governments or just to uh, you know uh, uh, public sector organizations it's actually not the case and brands in ways as they plan and as they uh, either it's on the security side or on the brand reputation side uh, they should start thinking 
with a wider lens about the different topics and the different ways that it could affect them, but also at the speed at which it could affect them as well. So their planning, their listening, their preparation activities should all be affected in ways that they wouldn't have had to have uh, predict in, in years gone by. Absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's um, and it's funny because we, we kind of, we kind of call it uh, uh, internally, at least in the company, we kind of call it uh, orchestration, right? And, and getting into that rabbit hole of deep diving and analyzing this whole conversation around the divorce between uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard led us to just, it, it just strengthened our belief that, you know, kind of everyone can be targeted, every topic can be part of it. And no one is immune to that kind of, of uh, spread of conversation. And so that's why we call it sort of the, the rabbit hole of the orchestration around these, these narratives. And, you know, this is just two examples. I mean, it's the, the Ukraine-Russia conflict and Johnny Depp Amber Heard, but, but I guess the next, the next example is also really a great idea around like, what is it to, to look, and, and this is probably one of the most common topics, it's the elections, right? Yes, that's definitely one of the topics that people would expect uh, disinformation campaigns to be yeah. waged around. But it's amazing to think it's less than two years that we saw the general election in the US and the online conversations, but also the offline and the protests that took place in Washington. Uh, and you know, I think the consensus has been since then that whilst it may have taken many people by surprise, a lot of the conversations were taking place beforehand on social media. And so I think uh, governments, the US has become much more aware that there are signals to be detected online uh, and to look at the different conversations that are taking place in the different corners of the internet uh, to be able to see what are the possible actions that are going to be taking. So when it came to the US midterms, it was that frame of mind that we approached the elections and what we were seeing. What was interesting with this elections compared to many other elections in the past were maybe the proportion of the conversation that was consumed by fake accounts was much bigger. Maybe it would have been, we've seen 15, 20, 25, 30 plus percent of the conversation driven by fake accounts. When it came to the midterms this year, last month, we actually saw much lower numbers of inauthentic profiles yeah. as a proportion of the conversation. Now, on the one hand, you could say that's great news. Maybe that's a signal. Maybe, maybe. that's a sign right, that actually disinformation is on the <laughs> is on the lower, is on the down uh, trend. But actually, unfortunately, we found that the opposite was true. That the disinformation and misinformation campaigns that were being waged were much more localized much more focused on local statewide issues using less inauthentic profiles but were successful in reaching and impacting just as many people through the conversations that they were engaged in um, and so we saw on a state every state particularly uh, the closely fought states we saw the conversations and the debates around specific candidates and the uh, controversies that came up during the course of the election campaign that were being propagated, were being amplified. And I think something that a conversation that we had internally regularly was about the, the concept of the tactic of drowning the noise and the general chaos. So we see many of the profiles um, that were participating in specifically the hashtag stolen elections. Uh, we saw a massive increase uh, in the days leading up to the elections, up to the point that it was 14% of the conversation that was driven by inauthentic profiles. Now, if we cast our mind back at two years, like I mentioned, one thing particularly we were looking for were the signals of protest or uh, you know, unhappiness amongst the electorate. And particularly in the days leading up to the elections, we saw the phrase and the hashtag stolen elections, but also one in 10 of all of those conversations in that specific discussion also included the word consequence. And when we talk about consequence, we mean that there is going to be a consequence, something yeah. that is going to spill out on the streets or there's going to be an action taken um, if one group or the other are not happy with the results of the election. So that's incredibly important, uh, incredibly important to, to monitor. Um, the takeaway, I think, for 2022 is, is disinformation, misinformation campaigns became evolved and became more sophisticated, became more statewide, uh, became lower in proportion, lower in number, but equal or greater in terms of impact. 
Um, and it means that the tools that we have and the attention that we give to those conversations have to continue to evolve. I think another, you know, another kind of key takeaway that we've seen <clears throat> throughout the, the the last few years is that when we were when we were discussing, you know, kind of um, election meddling and election interference, uh, we we can say for a fact, hardcore fact, that it was it was kind of much less known of a factor when we are thinking of the the governmental agencies and their knowledge and expertise around it, and even even allocating budgets, allocating budgets and creating dedicated teams and departments, right? And so we, we see that from seeing the number of solicitation from the people that are coming to us, whether it's from when we talk about and large enterprise consumer centric, like very large brands worldwide, but we can see that back in the days a few years back, there, there was almost no attention to trying and solve the problem because it seemed like something very distant, right? And today, when we look at the midterms elections, we see that from our perspective, but also when we speak to all our different partners in the ecosystem, universities, NGOs, think tanks, and other technological companies, um, we are all together as a group within the truth tech kind of realm. Uh, you like that one, right? The truth tech <laughs> one? Yeah, I'm sure you like this. Um, we kind of understand that we see the rise in demand of saying, we cannot ignore this anymore. We can't ignore this anymore from a budgetary perspective and, and, and from a, um, I want to say from, a, from, from, a, from an attention standpoint. The span of attention is huge and it's worrying and alarming and no one can deny it. That's it. But we got to that point really, really I don't want to say too late, but to us, it seemed obvious. But to the external world outside of the ecosystem, us as being the ecosystem, it's in distant. And now we are at a stage where we say, here we are. We need to fight this. We need to fight this together. And we need to know better than what we did and what we saw for the last few years. So let's delve into that. Um, before we do, just a reminder that we're going to be coming to questions in just a few moments. Yep. So leave your questions in the chat. I'm picking them up on my phone. So we're going to be going through some of the questions in a minute. Um, but one of the things, we didn't just want to talk through some of the unpleasant or lowlights uh, over the course of the year, but actually we wanted to make it a little bit more practical. So Dan, I don't know if you want to talk us through yeah. some of those things, uh, just some takeaways, you know, high, or, or you know, high level takeaways yeah. of things that people should be aware of as they're going into 2023. So, you know, we, we, we thought it would make sense to kind of talk about the three major pillars that we see being not just involved, like deeply affected by that problem that we're seeing right for the last few years and i think it revolves around the individuals the dan's and the rafis and the miris and the and the josh that are here on the call but it kind of revolves around the individuals themselves that are getting involved into this it revolves around the fact that um the largest organizations are being part of this right there is no way of escaping it uh because when we release a product and when we talk about our brand our executive teams anything of that sort, but like we just spoke, you know, five seconds ago, we spoke about which is the uh, the public sector and the organizations that are part of the larger array of, of those public sector agencies. And so I think, you know, the one common denominator that we always talk about, and it's kind of a, it's not just a simple, um, simplistic way of saying this, but we genuinely believe that, and we do it on a daily basis, by the way, the common denominator between those three major pillars, individuals, enterprise realm, and the public sector, is that when you look at something, when you're watching a clip on TikTok or on Facebook, when you are reading a post on Twitter, the one question that we always say to people, and we're going to watch out for this, is take your time. Before you share something, before you react, before you comment on something, all you got to do is think twice and, and, and try and realize whether are you part of the snowball? Are you creating the snowball mistakenly? And that's kind of the differentiation between dis disinformation and misinformation. Am I doing this kind of on purpose with a nefarious intent or am I, am I really being the target here? Am I the prey per se? Um, 
And so the common denominator that we see here is that you need to think twice before you act and you make a decision, whether you want to respond, whether you want to share that. And that's the same, that is the exact same comment and the exact same remark and kind of recommendation that we give to the, the, the top tier information warfare analysts that we have been collaborating with, but also to my mom. I say the exact same thing to my mom because we're all kind of really in the same pond of social media conversation. So we, we ought to look at that thing within, you know, through the same lenses of skepticism, like we said at the beginning. So make sure that you think before you react. Make sure that you are, as an individual, for example, you know, it only takes a few seconds to understand whether it's only you that is getting involved around something, or maybe, maybe it's the genuine belief of your friends, right? Your neighborhood friends and your college friends and, and, and your family members. I'm not saying that every time you see something on Facebook or Twitter, you're going to pick up your phone and say, Ma, do you believe in that message? Because otherwise you are literally ruining the, the live kind of conversation that we have and the, the livelihood of social media platforms. You don't have to take 15 minutes to think every time and research. That's maybe for the true crazy people like us. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the same recommendation to my mom and to the audience here and to the public sector people. But it's be skeptical to a point so that when you make a decision to, get a, to whether get involved or not, you, you have a better factual background about who we're standing in front of and what is the nature and the intent behind the scenes, what we call what is the agenda, kind of. Right? So we're going to kick off with questions, but actually, if you allow me to start off with one of my own, as we go into 2023, we are increasingly being asked by private companies, by brands, whether they are in the consumer space or, or, or in, the, in the B2B, um, how they should be thinking about either the word disinformation or right. inauthenticity listening when it comes to uh, social media um, and how they should plan and expect that for next year. What, what would you say to them? You know, it kind of, um, it kind of, the way that we're seeing, we're seeing this, and I, I can't, re maybe you know who said that quote, but I can't remember the origin of that quote, which is, it takes years to build a trustworthy brand and mm -hmm. credible brand. But today it kind of takes only a few seconds to sort of um, destroy that right. with the wrong words, mm. with the wrong narrative. Mm -hmm. And so every time we, we, we speak to enterprise brands around the world, whether it's in the US, Asia Pacific, Africa, uh, uh, Central and South America, um, we always look at that, that disinformation and propaganda as a threat from a reputational standpoint. It is a marketing issue, a communications issue. It is a crisis management issue, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes real things will happen to the wrong brands at the wrong time. And think about the fact that if you are a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. think about the importance of being yeah. a publicly traded company. Yeah. And then people can join a movement of, of uh, what do you call it? Pump and dump situations mm -hmm. on subreddits within the reddit community mm -hmm. and twitter echo chambers so so when we when we see the threat for enterprise it's always a combination of i'd like to say of security from a from a brand and legal perspective but then it, it always kind of evolves back into the brand perception mm -hmm. and and the brand credibility and trustworthiness of the consumers out there it's the consumer insights world, right? If you don't know, and that's what we always say to the CMOs and CISOs of the world, which is if you don't know what's happening in your backyard and you don't know how kind of one snowball is affecting your brand and how it's, mm -hmm. being, how it's been orchestrated, right? In, they, re in real time. In real time, in real time, right? Not you know, retroactively nine months ago, mm -hmm. in real time. If you don't know what's happening in your own backyard, you're just going to have a hard time sort of navigating through the muddy waters of, of mm -hmm. social media out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So th that's how we're looking at this. Thank you. We have a great question from Ross, a real curveball. Right. Who asked, what was the biggest challenge when working with Twitter 
to understand the impact of mis and disinformation. Mm. So maybe also when, you know, when working with Twitter, kind of how did we approach working out the number even? So, you know, personally speaking, I gotta say that the one thing that made our job, um, I don't wanna say difficult, but more difficult was the fact that when we realized that some companies out there, like ours or other technology companies are using advanced machine learning and AI to kind of objectively understand the truth of what's happening internally. And then we compare that to the, the techniques that were employed, you know, kind of pre-Musk era. Um, we were shocked. I gotta say, we were shocked, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's been published out there, you know, when we realized that there were um, a lot of the, the testing to understand spam and bot accounts revolved around manually testing a couple of accounts every day. Um, and sometimes even in a way kind of being incentivized by speed and not by quality. Mm. That's something that on a personal level made my job just on, on, you know, on the one hand more important, but on the other hand, difficult because I said it is going to be extremely hard to it's kind of the gap between doing things manually and thoroughly and then doing things thoroughly but but automatically and and, and that gap made it extremely difficult for us to sort of make musk and his team and eventually twitter to say we should find a way to combine the thorough manual testing and analysis but also combine that with the proper ai algorithm it's because the, the discrepancy was really large from our perspective and from their perspective as well. Absolutely. Um, we have another really, really good question. Um, and it's something that we discuss all the time on any topic that we're looking at and is really important is, can you say to what extent yep. that real people are actually interacting with fake accounts? And I know I've heard you speak about this before. And I know there's different ways of approaching or the different process. Right in which this happens. Wow. I mean, my God, I don't even know if we have enough time to answer this <laughs> yeah. question. In two but, minutes. <laughs> right, in, in, in two minutes. Um, so, you know, we, maybe we can give a, a quick example of, of how, and we're not going to be talking about, when we speak about taking a positive brand, launching a new, a new product around cereals per se, um, I, I, I think the conversation will be, there's a lot of genuine folks that are getting involved. When we look at the spiciest topics and not just a big topic like Johnny Depp, Amber Heard, when we go into the deeper echo chambers, when you see like, like crazy genuine movie fans that are following every step and every move mm -hmm. of the Aquaman 2 and the whole DC comics universe, um, the level of social engineering that is put into influencing other people's opinion is massive, which means that when it's not a game of quantity, it's a game of quality. And that game of quality with the spam and bot accounts, it could be five accounts that are socially engineered well enough to skew with 95% of the public opinion around, around a certain echo chamber. So, there's no, there's no one real figure of every time bots are involved, 27% of real people are getting involved. Like, th th there's no one, it, it's a really large scale. But I can tell you for sure that when, when the odds are, not just the odds, but when the incentive, right? Whether it's a financial incentive, a political incentive, when the incentive is large, then a lot of the times we, as real people, we just get affected. And I don't want to say 100% of the time, but it's definitely not in the low 5 to 10%. It yeah. could be dozens of percentages of real people getting exposed to the wrong message and the wrong identities. That, that, that's, the, that's the one problem. When we go deep dive into, when we deep dive into the rabbit hole. That, that's, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you did well because I know you can. You did well just covering that in two minutes. I know you could speak about it fast. Maybe uh, we'll have a whole virtual event because even just talking about fake accounts, we haven't even divided the difference between 
trolls, sock puppets and bots and the way they interact with each other in order to interact with actual real accounts. So it's a whole, an area that we, we cover greatly and regularly uh, across we do. different topics. So we're gonna have to leave it there. I know there were more questions, so apologies for not being able to get to all of them. And I know we've run a few minutes late, so thank you for staying with us. Um, you have been our guinea pigs as we've run our first ever <laughs> virtual event. So we thank you for that. Um, it's for any other information, and we've mentioned a few different case studies, topics, blogs. Um, you can find them on the sarabra.com website. Uh, and you can also find many videos as well that we've filmed about topics and also some of the uh, uh, trends that we, we've touched on yep. now, uh, also on our YouTube page uh, and also on our LinkedIn uh, feed as well. So check out uh, the Sarabra uh, LinkedIn page. Um, we're going to be Doing many more virtual events as I mentioned at the beginning so we'd love to hear your suggestions of topics uh, people you want to hear so it's not just us you don't oh, just yeah. want to hear from us you hear, hear from other more interesting people as well so please get in touch uh, but for now thank you very much for joining we've really loved uh, having you uh, and being able to cover the topics that we love talking about every single day and don't and don't hesitate to shoot us an email I mean, that's the easiest way, I guess. Yeah. So don't hesitate. We're here to answer anything you guys have. So yeah, absolutely. And if you're in Tel Aviv, get in touch for a coffee or some FIFA. Thanks for joining. Thank you, guys.